the weather and the climate are making news in more than one reach. Severe flooding has killed at least 72 people. In Under siege in the grip of unmitigated catastrophe. The pictures coming out of Australia tonight are apocalyptic. Flames devouring homes, huge black and brown blossoms of smoke. It's so hot the government had to change its forecast maps, adding new shades of purple for temperatures possibly hitting 130 degrees. Scenes like this are becoming more common. The entire planet has gotten hotter in recent decades. So wildfires are scorching parts of the Australian island state of Tasmania. Thousands of people have fled the flames. More than 40 fires are still burning across Tasmania after a heat wave with temperatures up to 40 degrees hit the Australian island state. Today, we learned some facts about how this earth is changing and how fast. New research concludes that Antarctica is melting. It's the worst drought in the nation's breadbasket since at least the 1950s. In some parts of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, you have brown, shriveled fields of corn and soybeans. Climate change is not a hoax. More droughts and floods and wildfires are not a joke. They are a threat to our children's future. NOAA, an agency that studies climate, is out with, out with the first comprehensive government report linking extreme weather to man-made climate change. Denying examples like these is only lying to yourself. It's apparent that climate change is happening, and it's happening now. But to what extent, or what can we expect for the future? In this short documentary, we will examine the past, the present, and our inevitable future. you learn from the past about our climate and the changes and how you can use that research to help us now to help us understand what's happening now well and certainly by looking at the past we get a sense of what we call climate dynamics how how um, how different can the climate get in the past how can we um, understand the climate system the feedbacks and how accentuated they might become under different conditions. So um, studying paleoclimate uh, in the past is, is like um, reading lab notes of the earth of what, what went on before. And one of the things that we learned is that most recently I just published a paper that points out the fact that it, back in the middle of Pliocene about three to three and a half million years ago when we think of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, say 350 to 400 parts per million. The Arctic was very different. It was completely forested. Um, as I said before, no Greenland ice sheet. And that was an equilibrium situation that was sustained for thousands and thousands of years. So what we're doing now in the climate system is, of course, we've accelerated ourselves back up to 400 uh, parts per million in the atmosphere. Of carbon dioxide and so the earth is is you know with all its feedbacks it's slowly migrating in that warmer direction slowly what did we used to think that was 10 years ago slowly was a hundred years but now in 2013 slowly is only decades slowly is faster than anticipated Now we're going to speak to Dr. Michael Rawlings of the Climate System Research Center and hear from him the impact of climate change on our oceans, precipitation, and the increased amount of fresh water and what that'll do to our ocean system. Okay. So what have you learned um, based on your research uh, about climate change? Uh, well, what my research has been showing is um, one of the interesting aspects of the research is that the uh, water cycle is getting more intense. So if we look at uh, precipitation patterns, uh, river discharge flowing in rivers, in the Arctic anyway at least, um, the cycle is getting more intense. So there's more precipitation, more snowfall each year, uh, the rivers are running higher. So basically just the water cycle is getting more um, accelerated. Um, and we're seeing that in other parts of the world as well. Um, other aspects, aspects of my research, we recently looked at um, snow patterns across Siberia and found that um, some of the rivers in Siberia are producing more 
uh, river flow. There's basically more water coming out of rivers to the Arctic Ocean, uh, the large rivers in Eurasia. And we find that um, that probably is due to more snowfall falling um, in the winter months. So you get more snow in winter, a lot of that burns off in the spring, produce high river flows. And so we've been able to link um, increases in snowfall across Siberia with the increases in river discharge flowing through the Arctic Ocean. And that has implications for things like uh, fresh water along the coastal shelves along the Arctic Ocean for productivity, the food web, and also potentially for, um, it might slow down the global thermal haline circulation if enough fresh water were to flow into the North Atlantic. There's some scenarios where we think that the freshwater cycle may um, the increase in freshwater in the North Atlantic may actually slow down that global thermal haline circulation. I believe um, freshwater resources, the impacts of warming on precipitation patterns, and then heat stress. Um, many people wouldn't, in colder climates, in let's say Canada, wouldn't mind a little bit of warming in the winter. That doesn't seem so um, so dire. Um, we might lose some snow. And, which will decrease potentially recreational activity through the winter. But I think it's the summertime heat and the heat stress that might really start to impact some folks, particularly in cities, moving forward. That's that's my personal opinion on where the, the biggest impacts on on warming may impact uh, humans is in you know, things like heat stress. It's there's no question that as we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're going to melt the glaciers and we're causing the thermal expansion of the of the surface waters of the ocean, and we're we're contributing more water from the ice sheets back into into the ocean to cause sea level to rise. More importantly, or, or usually things change on you know thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, that kind of time scale. So that was one thing that that. You know, it really impressed upon me being here at UMass that, you know, there are there have been times, for instance, when CO2 has been higher than it is today in the atmosphere, CO2 levels. But that kind of a change has happened over thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, as opposed to decades or, or, or yearly changes today. Greg has a point. In the past, we've seen these changes happen in a period of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. But now, in the past century, these kinds of changes have happened only in decades and years of time. Sea level rise. So as we melt more ice caps and the ocean, um, a lot, a lot of people are going to be displaced and over really live in areas that will be affected by sea level rise. I think in the next, uh, you know, few hundred years. So that's, you know, you have a large displacement of people that's going to happen from sea level rise and up a lot of water and, and irrigation issues that's going to come from prolonged and increased droughts, I think. That's the Thank you for watching Climate Change, a documentary on our dangerous future. Here are some informational websites you can visit to learn more about climate change and its impacts on our future. The Center for Climate and Energy Solutions www.c2es.org The Climate Institute www.climate.org and the United States Global Change Research Program www.usgcrp.gov Thank you. We've examined the past, looked at the present, and talked with scientists about the future. Now it's up to you to decide what to do with that information. Albert Einstein once said, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. Now is the time to make a difference. And now is today.